Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous video in this series, we introduced the linear advection equation, which is an example of a hyperbolic PDE. Here, we'll look at solving this equation numerically using a finite difference method. We'll introduce the idea of the CFL condition that places a necessary constraint on the design of our finite difference scheme, and we'll also look at the related concept of upwinding. We now consider solving the linear advection equation ut plus cux equals zero using a finite difference method. And you might ask why we use finite differences. In the previous video, we looked at analyzing the linear advection equation using characteristics, which gave us an insight into the flow of information and also allowed us to solve a PDE by reducing it to a family of ODEs. And in fact, characteristics are a viable solution technique for a PDE. However, they become complicated in two and three dimensions and also for nonlinear problems. And finite differences are actually a much more practical choice that can apply over a broad variety of cases. The linear advection equation is an initial boundary value problem, and we can impose an initial condition at time t equals zero, and also a boundary condition. And since this is a first order equation, we can impose a single boundary condition. And through our consideration of characteristics in the previous video, we can impose a boundary condition at one side of our domain, depending on the sign of C and the direction of characteristics. And if we develop a finite difference approximation, that will lead to a grid in the xt plane. So we can have a grid as shown, where we have a spacing delta t in the t direction and a spacing delta x in the x direction. Now, the first step in developing a finite difference approximation for the advection equation is to consider the CFL condition, named after Courant, Friedrichs, and Louis and this was published in 1928. And the CFL condition is a necessary condition for the convergence of a finite difference approximation to a hyperbolic problem. And suppose that we now discretize ut plus cux equals zero in space and time using the explicit scheme un plus one j minus unj over delta t plus c unj minus unj minus 1 over delta x is equal to 0. And here, unj is our approximation of our solution at tn and xj, where tn is equal to n delta t and xj is equal to j delta x. If we rewrite this equation, then we can obtain that un plus 1j is equal to 1 minus nu unj plus nu un j minus 1. And here, nu is defined as c delta t divided by delta x. And we can see here that nu will be a dimensionless number. We can also see that un plus 1j depends only on un j and un j minus 1. Let's now make a definition. We say that the domain of dependence of un plus 1j is the set of values that it depends on. And we know that un plus 1j depends on unj and unj minus 1. And if we follow the dependencies of those terms and we draw the dependencies in the xt plane, then we'll end up with a triangle of terms. Similarly, we can define the domain of dependence for our exact solution at u of tn plus 1 and xj. And that will be determined by the characteristic curve passing through tn plus 1 and xj. And this leads us to the CFL condition, which tells us that for a convergence scheme, the domain of dependence of the PDE must lie within the domain of dependence of the numerical method. So, Let's take a look at a few examples. Suppose the dashed line indicates characteristics passing through tn plus 1 and xj. So in this case, the scheme below would satisfy the CFL condition. 
However, suppose now that the characteristics have a larger slope, so a larger c, then in this case we would not satisfy the CFL condition. Another case where we would not satisfy the CFL condition is if the characteristics point in the opposite direction. And now the dashed line is well outside of this triangle of terms in our numerical method. We can ask ourselves what goes wrong if the CFL condition is violated. And to answer this, let's look at our exact solution u at x and t. And by following the characteristic through x and t, we can see that that solution value will depend on an initial value u0 at an x0 that is outside the numerical method's domain of dependence. Therefore, the numerical approximation of u of x and t is insensitive to the value of u0 at x0, and that means that the method cannot possibly converge. Suppose we look at the case where c is greater than 0. Then we require that our constant nu, defined as c times delta t divided by delta x, has to be less than or equal to 1 for the CFL condition to be satisfied. Note, however, that the CFL condition is only a necessary and not sufficient condition for convergence. However, it has great value in practice due to its simplicity. And it allows us to easily reject possible finite difference discretizations with very little investigation. For example, suppose we look at our numerical scheme for ut plus cux equals zero. Then this cannot possibly be convergent for c less than zero, because as we saw, in that case, the characteristics would lie outside of our numerical domain of dependence. But we could ask ourselves what small change we can make to get a better method when c is less than zero. As foreshadowed earlier, we should pick our method to reflect the direction of propagation of information. And this motivates the upwind scheme for ut plus c ux equals zero that can handle both positive and negative c. So we'll define un plus 1j to be unj minus c delta t of delta x, unj minus unj minus 1 for c greater than 0. And we'll define it to be unj minus c delta t of delta x, unj plus 1 minus unj if c is less than 0. So for the case when c is less than zero, we switch the direction of terms that we are using in our spatial finite difference derivative. And that will then ensure that the CFL condition is satisfied. And therefore, the upwind scheme will satisfy the CFL condition for any nu where the magnitude of nu is less than or equal to one. And nu is often referred to as the CFL number, and as mentioned, it is a dimensionless number. The term upwinding is used more generally in scientific computing. And if we think of the flow of information as a wind, then it makes sense that our spatial discretizations should use grid points that upwind of our current location in order to satisfy the CFL condition. Another method that seems appealing is the central difference method, where we would use a centred finite difference for our spatial discretization. So therefore, we would have the scheme un plus 1j minus unj divided by delta t plus c unj plus 1 minus unj minus 1 over 2 delta x is equal to 0. And if we drew the numerical domain of dependence, then we would now have a triangle that extends in both the negative and positive directions. And therefore, this would satisfy the CFL for any new with magnitude less than or equal to one, regardless of the sign of C. Unfortunately though, we'll see that this is a bad method in practice.
And this highlights how the CFL condition is a necessary condition, but sometimes not sufficient for obtaining a convergent numerical method.